Question 13 of Summa Theologica, Pars Prima, Initial Questions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Jim Ruddy. Summa Theologica, Pars Prima, Initial Questions by St. Thomas Aquinas. Translated by the Fathers of the English Dominican Province. Question 13. The Names of God. After the consideration of those things which belong to the divine knowledge, we now proceed to the consideration of the divine names. For everything is named by us according to our knowledge of it. Under this head there are twelve points of inquiry. First, whether God can be named by us. Second, whether any names applied to God are predicated of Him substantially. Third, whether any names applied to God are said of Him literally or are all to be taken metaphorically. Fourth, whether any names applied to God are synonymous. Fifth, whether some names are applied to God and to creatures univocally or equivocally. Sixth, whether, supposing they are applied analogically, they are applied first to God or to creatures. Seventh, whether any names are applicable to God from time. Eighth, whether this name God is a name of nature or of the operation. Ninth, whether this name God is a communicable name. Tenth, whether it is taken univocally or equivocally as signifying God by nature, by participation, and by opinion. Eleventh, whether this name, Who is, is the supremely appropriate name of God. And twelve, whether affirmative propositions can be formed about God. First article, whether a name can be given to God. Objection one, it seems that no name can be given to God. For Dionysius says that of him there is neither name nor can one be found of him. And it is written, What is his name, and what is the name of his son, if thou knowest? Objection 2. Further, every name is either abstract or concrete. But concrete names do not belong to God, since he is simple. Nor do abstract names belong to him, forasmuch as they do not signify any perfect subsisting thing. Therefore, no name can be said of God. Objection 3. Further, Nouns are taken to signify substance with quality. Verbs and participles signify substance with time. Pronouns the same with demonstration or relation. But none of these can be applied to God, for he has no quality, nor accident, nor time. Moreover, he cannot be felt so as to be pointed out, nor can he be described by relation, inasmuch as relations serve to recall a thing mentioned before by nouns, participles, or demonstrative pronouns. Therefore God cannot in any way be named by us. On the contrary, it is written, The Lord is a man of war, almighty is his name. I answer that, since according to the philosopher, words are signs of ideas, and ideas the similitude of things. It is evident that words relate to the meaning of things signified through the medium of the intellectual conception. It follows, therefore, that we can give a name to anything in so far as we can understand it. Now it was shown above that in this life we cannot see the essence of God, but we know God from creatures as their principle, and also by way of excellence and remotion. In this way, therefore, he can be named by us from creatures, yet not so that the name which signifies him expresses the divine essence in itself. Thus the name man expresses the essence of man in himself, since it signifies the definition of man by manifesting his essence, for the idea expressed by the name is the definition. Reply to Objection 1. The reason why God has no name or is said to be above being named is because his essence is above all that we understand about God and signify in word. Reply to Objection 2. Because we know and name God from creatures, 
The names we attribute to God signify what belongs to material creatures of which the knowledge is natural to us. And because in creatures of this kind what is perfect and subsistent is compound, whereas their form is not a complete subsisting thing, but rather is that whereby a thing is, hence it follows that all names used by us to signify a complete subsisting thing must have a concrete meaning as applicable to compound things. Whereas names given to signify simple forms signify a thing not as subsisting, but as that whereby a thing is. As, for instance, whiteness signifies that whereby a thing is white. And, as God is simple and subsisting, we attribute to him abstract names to signify his simplicity and concrete names to signify his substance and perfection, although both these kinds of names fail to express his mode of being, forasmuch as our intellect does not know him in this life as he is. Reply to Objection 3. To signify substance with quality is to signify the suppositum with a nature or determined form in which it subsists. Hence, as some things are said of God in a concrete sense, to signify His subsistence and perfection, so likewise nouns are applied to God, signifying substance with quality. Further, verbs and participles which signify time are applied to him because his eternity includes all time. For as we can apprehend and signify simple subsistences only by way of compound things, so we can understand and express simple eternity only by way of temporal things, because our intellect has a natural affinity to compound and temporal things. But demonstrative pronouns are applied to God as describing what is understood, not what is sensed. For we can only describe him as far as we understand him. Thus, according as nouns, participles, and demonstrative pronouns are applicable to God, so far can he be signified by relative pronouns. Second article, whether any name can be applied to God substantially. Objection 1. It seems that no name can be applied to God substantially. For Damascene says, Everything said of God signifies not his substance, but rather shows forth what he is not, or expresses some relation or something following from his nature or operation. Objection 2. Further, Dionysius says, You will find a chorus of holy doctors addressed to the end of distinguishing clearly and praiseworthily the divine processions in the denomination of God. Thus the names applied by the holy doctors in praising God are distinguished according to the divine processions themselves. But what expresses the procession of anything does not signify its essence. Therefore the names applied to God are not said of him substantially. Objection 3. Further, a thing is named by us according as we understand it. But God is not understood by us in this life in his substance Therefore neither is any name we can use applied substantially to God. On the contrary, Augustine says, The being of God is the being strong or the being wise, or whatever else we may say of that simplicity whereby his substance is signified. Therefore all names of this kind signify the divine substance. I answer that negative names applied to God or signifying his relation to creatures manifestly do not at all signify his substance, but rather express the distance of the creature from him, or his relation to something else, or rather the relation of creatures to himself. But as regards absolute and affirmative names of God, as good, wise, and the like, various and many opinions have been given. For some have said that all such names, although they are applied to God affirmatively, nevertheless have been brought into use more to express some remotion from God, rather than to express anything that exists positively in Him. Hence they assert that when we say that God lives, we mean that God is not like an inanimate thing, and the same in like manner applies to other names. And this was taught by Rabbi Moses. Others say that these names applied to God signify his relationship towards creatures. Thus, in the words, God is good, we mean God is the cause of goodness in things, and the same rule applies to other names. Both of these opinions, however, seem to be untrue for three reasons. First, 
because in neither of them can a reason be assigned why some names more than others are applied to God, for he is assuredly the cause of bodies in the same way as he is the cause of good things. Therefore, if the words God is good signified no more than God is the cause of good things, it might in like manner be said that God is a body inasmuch as he is the cause of bodies. So also to say that he is a body implies that he is not a mere potentiality as is primary matter. Secondly, because it would follow that all names applied to God would be said of him by way of being taken in a secondary sense, as healthy is secondarily said of medicine, forasmuch as it signifies only the cause of the health in the animal, which primarily is called healthy. Thirdly, because this is against the intention of those who speak of God, for in speaking that God lives, they assuredly mean more than to say that he is the cause of our life or that he differs from inanimate bodies. Therefore, we must hold a different doctrine, namely, that these names signify the divine substance and are predicated substantially of God, although they fall short of a full representation of him. Which is proved thus, for these names express God so far as our intellects know him, now, since our intellect knows God from creatures, it knows him as far as creatures represent him. Now, it is shown above that God prepossesses in himself all the perfections of creatures, being himself simply and universally perfect. Hence, every creature represents him and is like him so far as it possesses some perfection, yet it represents him not as something of the same species or genus, but as the excelling principle of whose form the effects fall short, although they derive some kind of likeness thereto, even as the forms of inferior bodies represent the power of the sun. This was explained above in treating of the divine perfection. Therefore, the aforesaid names signify the divine substance, but in an imperfect manner, even as creatures represent it imperfectly. So, when we say God is good, the meaning is not God is the cause of goodness or God is not evil, but the meaning is whatever good we attribute to creatures pre-exists in God and in a more excellent and higher way. Hence, it does not follow that God is good because he causes goodness, but rather, on the contrary, he causes goodness in things because he is good, according to what Augustine says, because he is good, we are are. Reply to Objection 1. Damascene says that these names do not signify what God is, forasmuch as by none of these names is perfectly expressed what he is, but each one signifies him in an imperfect manner, even as creatures represent him imperfectly. Reply to Objection 2. In the significance of names, that from which the name is derived is different sometimes from what it is intended to signify. As, for instance, this name stone is imposed from the fact that it hurts the foot, but it is not imposed to signify that which hurts the foot, but rather to signify a certain kind of body. Otherwise, everything that hurts the foot would be a stone. So we must say that these kinds of divine names are imposed from the divine processions, for as according to the diverse processions of their perfections, creatures are the representations of God, although in an imperfect manner. So likewise our intellect knows and names God according to each kind of procession, but nevertheless these names are not imposed to signify the procession it themselves, as if when we say God lives, the sense where life proceeds from him, but rather to signify the principle itself of things, insofar as life pre-exists in him, although it pre-exists in him in a more eminent way than can be understood or signified. Reply to Objection 3. We cannot know the essence of God in this life as he really is in himself, but we know him accordingly as he is represented in the perfections of creatures, and thus the names imposed by us signify him in that manner only. Third article, whether any name can be applied to God in its literal sense. 
Objection 1. It seems that no name is applied literally to God, for all names which we apply to God are taken from creatures, as was explained above. But the names of creatures are applied to God metaphorically, as when we say God is a stone or a lion or the like. Therefore, names are applied to God in a metaphorical sense. Objection 2. Further, no name can be applied literally to anything if it should be withheld from it rather than given to it. But all such names as good, wise, and the like are more truly withheld from God than given to him, as appears from Dionysius. Therefore, none of these names belong to God in their literal sense. Objection 3. Further, corporeal names are applied to God in a metaphorical sense only, since he is incorporeal. But all such names imply some kind of corporeal condition, for their meaning is bound up with time and composition and like corporeal conditions. Therefore, all these names are applied to God in a metaphorical sense. On the contrary, Ambrose says, some names there are which express evidently the property of the divinity, and some which express the clear truth of the divine majesty, but others there are which are applied to God metaphorically by way of similitude. Therefore not all names are applied to God in a metaphorical sense, but there are some which are said of him in their literal sense. I answer that, according to the preceding article, our knowledge of God is derived from the perfections which flow from him to creatures, which perfections are in God in a more eminent way than in creatures. Now our intellect apprehends them as they are in creatures, and as it apprehends them it signifies them by names. Therefore as to the names applied to God, namely the perfections which they signify, such as goodness, life, and the like, and their mode of signification, As regards what is signified by these names, they belong properly to God, and more properly than they belong to creatures, and are applied primarily to Him. But as regards their mode of signification, they do not properly and strictly apply to God, for their mode of signification applies to creatures. Reply to Objection 1. There are some names which signify these perfections flowing from God to creatures in such a way that the imperfect way in which creatures receive the divine perfection is part of the very signification of the name itself, as stone signifies a material being, and names of this kind can be applied to God only in a metaphorical sense. Other names, however, express these perfections absolutely, without any such mode of participation being part of their signification as the words being, good, living, and the like, and such names can be literally applied to God. Reply to Objection 2. Such names as these, as Dionysius shows, are denied of God for the reason that what the name signifies does not belong to him in the ordinary sense of his signification, but in a more eminent way. Hence Dionysius says also that God is above all substance and all life. Reply to Objection 3. These names, which are applied to God literally, imply corporeal conditions not in the thing signified, but as regards their mode of signification, whereas those which are applied to God metaphorically imply and mean a corporeal condition in the thing signified. Fourth article, whether names applied to God are synonymous. Objection 1. It seems that these names applied to God are synonymous names, for synonymous names are those which mean exactly the same. But these names applied to God mean entirely the same thing in God, for the goodness of God is his essence, and likewise it is his wisdom. Therefore these names are entirely synonymous. Objection 2. Further, if it be said these names signify one and the same thing in reality, but differ in idea, it can be objected that an idea to which no reality corresponds is a vain notion. Therefore, if these ideas are many and the thing is one, it seems also that all these ideas are vain notions. Objection 3. Further, a thing which is one in reality and in idea is more one than what is one in reality and many in idea, but God is supremely one. Therefore, it seems that he is not one in reality and many in idea, 
and thus the names applied to God do not signify different ideas, and thus they are synonymous. On the contrary, all synonyms united with each other are redundant as when we say vestiture clothing. Therefore, if all names applied to God are synonymous, we cannot properly say good God or the like, and yet it is written, O most mighty, great, and powerful, the Lord of hosts is thy name. I answer that these names spoken of God are not synonymous. This would be easy to understand if we said that these names are used to remove or to express the relation of cause to creatures, for thus it would follow that there are different ideas as regards the diverse things denied of God or as regards diverse effects connoted. But even according to what was said above, that these names signify the divine substance, although in an imperfect way, it is also clear from what has been said that they have diverse meanings. For the idea signified by the name is the conception in the intellect of the thing signified by the name. But our intellect, since it knows God from creatures, in order to understand God, forms conceptions proportional to the perfections flowing from God to creatures, which perfections pre-exist in God unitedly and simply, whereas in creatures they are received and divided and multiplied. As therefore to the different perfections of creatures there corresponds one simple principle represented by different perfections of creatures in a various and manifold manner, so also to the various and multiplied conceptions of our intellect there corresponds one altogether simple principle according to these conceptions imperfectly understood. Therefore, although the names applied to God signify one thing, still because they signify that under many and different aspects, they are not synonymous. Thus appears the solution of the first objection, since synonymous terms signify one thing under one aspect, for words which signify different aspects of one thing do not signify primarily and absolutely one thing, because the term only signifies the thing through the medium of the intellectual conception, as was said above. Reply to Objection 2. The many aspects of these names are not empty and vain, for there corresponds to all of them one simple reality represented by them in a manifold and imperfect manner. Reply to Objection 3. The perfect unity of God requires that what are manifold and divided in others should exist in Him simply and unitedly. Thus it comes about that He is one in reality, and yet multiple in idea, because our intellect apprehends Him in a manifold manner as things represent Him. Fifth article. Whether what is said of God and of creatures is univocally predicated of them. Objection 1. It seems that the things attributed to God and creatures are univocal, for every equivocal term is reduced to the univocal, as many are reduced to one. For if the name dog be said equivocally of the barking dog and of the dogfish, it must be said of some univocally, namely of all barking dogs, otherwise we proceed to infinitude. Now there are some univocal agents which agree with their effects in name and definition as man generates man. And there are some agents which are equivocal as the sun which causes heat, although the sun is hot only in an equivocal sense. Therefore it seems that the first agent to which all other agents are reduced is a univocal agent, and thus what is said of God and creatures is predicated univocally. Objection 2. Further, there is no similitude among equivocal things. Therefore, as creatures have a certain likeness to God, according to the word of Genesis, let us make man to our image and likeness, it seems that something can be said of God and creatures univocally. Objection 3. Further, measure is homogeneous with the thing measured, but God is the first measure of all beings. Therefore, God is homogeneous with creatures, and thus a word may be applied univocally to God and to creatures. On the contrary, whatever is predicated to various things under the same name, but not in the same sense, is predicated equivocally. But no name belongs to God in the same sense that it belongs to creatures. For instance, wisdom in creatures is a quality, but not in God. Now a different genus changes in essence, since the genus is part of the definition 
and the same applies to other things. Therefore, whatever is said of God and of creatures is predicated equivocally. Further, God is more distant from creatures than any creatures are from each other. But the distance of some creatures makes any univocal predication of them impossible, as is the case of those things which are not in the same genus. Therefore, much less can anything be predicated univocally of God and creatures, and so only equivocal predication can be applied to them. I answer that univocal predication is impossible between God and creatures. The reason of this is that every effect which is not an adequate result of the power of the efficient cause receives the similitude of the agent not in its full degree, but in a measure that falls short so that what is divided and multiplied in the effects resides in the agent simply and in the same manner. As, for example, the sun, by exercise of its one power, produces manifold and various forms in all inferior things. In the same way, as said in the preceding article, all perfections existing in creatures divided and multiplied pre-exist in God unitedly. Thus, when any term expressing perfection is applied to a creature, it signifies that perfection distinct in idea from other perfections, as, for instance, by the term wise applied to man, we signify some perfection distinct from a man's essence, and distinct from his power and existence, and from all similar things. Whereas when we apply to it God, we do not mean to signify anything distinct from his essence or power or existence. Thus also this term wise applied to man in some degree circumscribes and comprehends the thing signified, whereas this is not the case when it is applied to God. But it leaves the thing signified as incomprehended and as exceeding the signification of the name. Hence it is evident that this term wise is not applied in the same way to God and to man. The same rule applies to other terms, since no name is predicated univocally of God and of creatures. Neither, on the other hand, are names applied to God and creatures in a purely equivocal sense, as some have said, because if that were so, it follows that from creatures nothing could be known or demonstrated about God at all, for the reasoning would always be exposed to the fallacy of equivocation. Such a view is against the philosophers who proved many things about God, and also against what the Apostle says, the invisible things of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Therefore it must be said that these names are said of God and creatures in an analogous sense, that is, according to proportion. Now, names are thus used in two ways, either according as many things are proportionate to one, Thus, for example, healthy is predicated of medicine and urine in relation and proportion to health of a body, of which the former is the sign and the latter the cause. Or according as one thing is proportionate to another, thus healthy is said of medicine and animal, since medicine is the cause of health in the animal body. And in this way, some things are said of God and creatures analogically and not in a purely equivocal nor in a purely univocal sense. For we can name God only from creatures. Thus, whatever is said of God and creatures is said according to the relation of a creature to God as its principle and cause, wherein all perfections of things pre-exist excellently. Now, this mode of community of idea is a mean between pure equivocation and simple univocation. For in analogies, the idea is not, as it is in univocals, one and the same, yet it is not totally diverse as in equivocals, but a term which is thus used in a multiple sense signifies various proportions to some one thing. Thus healthy applied to urine signifies the sign of animal health, and applied to medicine signifies the cause of the same health. Reply to Objection 1. Although equivocal predications must be reduced to univocal, still in actions the non-univocal agent must precede the univocal agent. For the non-univocal agent is the universal cause of the whole species, as, for instance, the sun is the cause of the generation of all men, whereas the univocal agent is not the universal efficient cause of the whole species, otherwise it would be the cause of itself, since it is contained in the species, but is a particular cause of this individual, which it places under the species by way of participation. Therefore, the universal cause of the whole species is not 
a univocal agent. And the universal cause comes before the particular cause. But this universal agent, whilst it is not univocal, nevertheless is not altogether equivocal, otherwise it could not produce its own likeness, but rather it is to be called an analogical agent, as all univocal predications are reduced to one first non-univocal analogical predication, which is being. Reply to objection two. The likeness of the creature to God is imperfect, for it does not represent one and the same generic thing. Reply to objection three. God is not the measure proportioned to things measured, hence it is not necessary that God and creatures should be in the same genus. The arguments adduced in the contrary sense prove indeed that these names are not predicated univocally of God and creatures, yet they do not prove that they are predicated equivocally. Sixth article, whether names predicated of God are predicated primarily of creatures. Objection 1. It seems that names are predicated primarily of creatures rather than of God, for we name anything according as we know it, since names, as the philosopher said, are signs of ideas. But we know creatures before we know God. Therefore the names imposed by us are predicated primarily of creatures rather than of God. Objection 2. Further, Dionysius says, we name God from creatures, but names transferred from creatures to God are said primarily of creatures rather than of God, as lion, stone, and the like. Therefore all names applied to God and creatures are applied primarily to creatures rather than to God. Objection 3. Further, all names equally applied to God and creatures are applied to God as the cause of all creatures, as Dionysius says. But what is applied to anything through its cause is applied to it secondarily, for healthy is primarily predicated of animal rather than of medicine, which is the cause of health. Therefore these names are said primarily of creatures rather than of God. On the contrary, it is written, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom all paternity in heaven and earth is named. And the same applies to the other names applied to God and creatures. Therefore, these names are applied primarily to God rather than creatures. I answer that. In names predicated of many in an analogical sense, all are predicated because they have reference to some one thing, and this one thing must be placed in the definition of them all. And since that expressed by the name is the definition as the philosopher says, such a name must be applied primarily to that which is put in the definition of such other things, and secondarily to these others according as they approach more or less to that first. Thus, for instance, healthy applied to animals comes into the definition of healthy applied to medicine, which is called healthy as being the cause of health in the animal, and also into the definition of healthy which is applied to urine, which is called healthy insofar as it is the sign of the animal's health. Thus all names applied metaphorically to God are applied to creatures primarily rather than to God, because when said of God they mean only similitudes to such creatures. For a smiling applied to a field means only that the field is in the beauty of its flowering is like the beauty of the human smile by proportionate likeness. So the name of lion applied to God means only that God manifests strength in his works, as a lion in his. Thus it is clear that applied to God, the signification of names can be defined only from what is said of creatures, but to other names not applied to God in a metaphorical sense, the same rule would apply if they were spoken of God as the cause only, as some have supposed. For when it is said, God is good, it would then only mean God is the cause of the creature's goodness. Thus the term good applied to God would include in its meaning the creature's goodness. Hence good would apply primarily to creatures rather than to God. But as was shown above, these names are applied to God not as the cause only, but also essentially. For the words God is good or wise signify not only that he is the cause of wisdom or goodness, but that these exist in him in a more excellent way. Hence, as regards what the name signifies, these names are applied primarily to God rather than to creatures, 
because these perfections flow from God to creatures. But as regards the imposition of the names, they are primarily applied by us to creatures which we know first. Hence they have a mode of signification which belongs to creatures, as said above. Reply to objection 1. This objection refers to the imposition of the name. Reply to objection 2. The same rule does not apply to metaphorical and to other names, as said above. Reply to objection 3. This objection would be valid if these names were applied to God only as cause, and not also essentially, for instance, as healthy, is applied to medicine. Seventh article. Whether names which imply relation to creatures are predicated of God temporally. Objection 1. It seems that names which imply relation to creatures are not predicated of God temporally, for all such names signify the divine substance as is universally